Good afternoon. On behalf of Sunbelt Rentals Flooring Solutions, we would like to thank ISSA for the opportunity to bring to its members Concrete 101, the Foundations for, surf for Surface Preparation Success. Ron Bridges is our presenter today from Sunbelt Rentals Flooring Solutions. As our manager of the Concrete Specialist Program, Ron Bridges brings 35 plus years experience working with concrete surface preparation, polishing, repair, and maintenance programs. Ron has been all over North America, including Canada and Hawaii, teaching the art and science of concrete preparation and polishing. As you will soon see and hear, he is an expert in this area of floor care and a professional speaker on the subject. Additionally, Ron is a current and long-standing member of the American Society of Concrete Contractors, the International Concrete Repair Institute, Certified Flooring Installers, Flooring Contractors Association, and ISSA. He is available for further consultation after this webinar, and he and the entire Flooring Solutions team are available 24-7 to support you in this area of work. For additional fun, we will be giving away up to five Yeti mugs, as you see on the uh, web webinar, five, five Yeti uh, mugs in the Q&A session of the event, which, which ends our event today, in just a, a little bit. So if you do have questions along the way, please go to your on-screen Q&A box and type them in, and we will address them at the end of this presentation. So let's get started with our concrete one, the Foundations for Surface Preparation Success. Thank you, Roy. <clears throat> and I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. Some of you may be unfamiliar with the topics that I am covering today, but you are not alone in these ventures. These skill sets are very acquirable and Sunbelt Rentals Flooring Solutions is here to help you through training and support. Sunbelt Rentals Flooring Solutions offers help with project analysis, product selection, and product training. Each of our locations have trained people to help, and we will be providing you with our contact information and 24-7 support line at the end of this presentation. And with all our meetings, we like to start out with a safety message. And today's safety message is on the dangers of silica dust. Silica is the most common hazard on a work site. <clears throat> And inhaled silica dust scars the lungs and basically reduces their abilities to uh, process oxygen. Once the damage is done, there is no cure. OSHA has set a safe exposure limit, which is this little green algebraic form up here in the upper right hand corner. But basically it equates to a small pinch of dust like you see there on Lincoln's head. So as a rule of thumb, if you walk on a job site and you see a cloud of dust containing silica, they are already over that eight hour exposure limit. So where do we find silica? It is a common component of most of your building materials. It can be in the concrete, it's in the rock, it's in the overlays, the stucco. But what causes exposure is when we start disturbing these materials, when we start grinding the concrete or uh, sanding the uh, drywall, cutting the blocks. By OSHA standards, you can't even dry sweep a floor if it contains silica dust. So the way we control exposure is by either using a wet method, using water, or using properly sized HEPA dust collectors. Another item that helps is using air scrubbers to help filter the air and making sure that you're wearing the, the proper protective equipment for the job that you're doing. It's important to note that Sunbelt Rentals has the equipment to help contractors be compliant with the OSHA standard. It is the contractor's responsibility to make sure they are compliant. These uh, regulations can be found on OSHA's website. Concrete itself is a rather simple recipe. It's made by mixing sand, water, aggregate, and cement. 
but there's just so many factors that can affect the concrete, producing different degrees of hardness. The quality of the water, available aggregates, additives, the temperatures when it's poured. This here is a aggregate classification map of the United States. <clears throat> And it can help to give you an idea of what the hardness of your concrete is going to be in your local area. Concrete is made with locally sourced materials. So the aggregates will play a big part in the hardness of the concrete. Um, if you look in Florida there, you can see it's a blue state and it has very soft concrete. Their concrete is made up with soft limestone, sandstone and soft shell. Here in North Carolina, where I'm at, they use harder materials like granite and uh, quartz, making a, a much harder concrete. This here is a Mohs hardness test kit, um, originally designed by scientists to test the hardness of minerals. We can use it to get a good idea of how hard the surface of the concrete is. If you look at the picks, you can see that number two looks like it's kind of a plexiglass. Three looks like it might be made out of copper. And then the other three pins have different degree hardnesses of uh, metal. The way these picks are used is you'll hold them just like a pencil at about a 45 degree angle to the concrete, putting about as much pressure as you would on a pencil, you'll make a scratch in the concrete. Now, here in North Carolina, I will normally start with a five. So I'll take my five, I'll make a scratch. If it does scratch, I will drop down to a four to see what that does. Of course, if it doesn't scratch, then I will continue going up to a six, seven, until I get the one that makes a good scratch into the concrete to help determine the uh, surface strength. Now, when I start talking about diamonds, this will all tie in later in the presentation. Concrete surface profile, CSP. This is a system that was established by the uh, International Concrete Repair Institute. It is a scale of one through 10. Coating manufacturers use this to ensure proper surface preparation for their products. As a general rule, the thicker the product that you're putting down, the coarser that the uh, concrete surface profile has to be. This chart here is just a generalization. I do recommend that you always follow the manufacturer's um, instructions. But if you look at the top of the chart, these are materials to be applied. And you can see as you go down the chart, the materials are getting thicker. So your sealers of zero to three mils usually need about a one to two surface profile. Then as you start to get into your quarter um, inch overlays, they could have anywhere from a five to a 10. Then on the bottom of the chart, you have the preparation methods for these. So you have your grinding, which can get you anywhere from a one to a two, I'm sorry, a one to a three. Um, shop blasting will get you anywhere from a three to a nine. And then you have other tools that you can get higher concrete surface profiles if you need them. Here's some actual manufacturer's products that um, by Sherwin Williams. This first product is just a two-part epoxy. And you can see that it needs a concrete surface profile of about one to three. The second product and the third product are both a thicker mill item, and they need a much larger surface profile. They both are asking for a concrete surface profile of about four to six. So that's gonna have to be a shot blaster. And if you read there where it's highlighted, it says concrete surface shall be abrasive blasted. Again, the instructions are telling you to use a shot blaster.
Equipment selection. In order for Google Maps to give you directions, it needs to know two things. It needs to know where you're at and where you're going. Working with concrete's the same thing. The first thing you need to know is what are the current conditions and what are the final desired results. Getting the wrong equipment at the beginning may negate the ability to get the floor that the customer wanted. This picture here was a brand new building. The customer was going to use it for a uh, shop, but he wanted some sort of a protective coating over the concrete so that the orals would not sink into the concrete. The contractor went in there and used a shop blaster, which can leave what's called cornrows. Those are those stripes that you see going up and down through the concrete. He then put a clear coat over that, which had no ability to hide those marks. Contractor had to go back to this job, grind all that off, and then apply a two-part solid epoxy over top of it. That was not the floor that the owner of the building wanted, but at that point, we could not put the concrete back to give them what they wanted. So where are you starting from? What are the conditions of the floor, or the floor now? Is there a thick coating, a VCT, carpet? What's on the floor now? And then where do you wanna go? What is the final desired finish for this floor? Um, if they're putting down another thick coating or they're putting down ceramic tile, you don't need to be as concerned about removing items from that concrete as you do when you're polishing. You have to remember that that polished concrete or that concrete is gonna be your canvas when you're polishing. So the less damage you do at the beginning, the easier it is to give that customer the floor that they want. And then additional things that you wanna ask is how old is the concrete? Um, age really doesn't affect the work other than new concrete. As a general rule, you don't wanna be on concrete grinding it until it's at least 28 days old. There are exceptions to that, but it's still general rule, wait till it's 28 days old. And then how many square feet and what are the time constraints work together? If you're polishing with a 30 inch propane machine, it will take you eight hours to do a thousand square feet. So if you have 2000 square feet that need to be done in eight hours, the only way to accomplish that is with two machines. And then can you use propane? Are you in a large area that has proper ventilation? If not, what electric power is available and how far is it from where you're working? And then how do you access the job? Is there an elevator, a back door? Again, using the uh, propane machine, that unit weighs about 690 pounds. So getting it down the stairs could be possible, but gravity sure is gonna make it hard to get back up the stairs. Equipment. Floor scrapers are usually gonna be your first line of attack for removal of floor coverings. Uh, they can increase production by getting jobs done faster with less labor. Now, scrapers do not leave a clean surface. There'll always be some remaining glue or thin sap after you remove the product. A grinder is almost always needed afterwards to remove the remaining product. This is our line of flooring solution. Up here in the upper left hand corner, you have the BRB uh, 1500. That is a 1500 pound battery operated scraper. Under that, you have the BRB 3100, a 3100 pound battery operated scraper. In the middle there, you have a national little 110 unit. Those units are very good for getting into small tight spaces where you can't get a rider. And then on the right hand side, you have our propane units. You have the BRB 2800, and under that you have the BRB 4500. 
And with your scrapers, you have an array of blades to do for whatever it is that you're trying to take off the concrete. There on the left, you see the flat blades. Those are gonna be for scraping off coatings, uh, VCT, getting up glue and mastic. In the middle, you have a self-scoring blade. This unit, or these uh, are used for cutting the materials in strips, making it easier to roll up and throw away. And then on the right, you have shank blades. These are to help remove hard goods from the concrete. And this is just some examples of some of the things that you can remove with uh, scrapers. One of the things not often thought of is uh, there in the lower left-hand corner is buildup. A lot of times in factories, they'll have some sort of a process that will continue to drip on the floor and build up over time. Scrapers are very effective of going back in and taking that buildup back down. And then bigger is not always better. Uh, a lot of times customers think that they can get more work done with a 12 inch blade than a four inch. But what happens is when you take that 12 inch, you're taking the force of that machine and spreading it out over a much larger area, making it harder to drive. Just like that example of the nail versus the bowling pin. Get a big enough hammer, you can still drive the bowling pin. This is the national, the little 110 unit, taking up some VCT tile, some ceramic tile. In a minute, you'll get another good view of the carpet blade there, how it's cutting it in little strips, just kind of rolling it up in front of the machine. Makes it real easy to take materials and dispose of them. This here is the BRB 3100. It is a battery operated machine. One of the advantages to battery operated machines is you can use them in small confined spaces because there is no fumes coming from a uh, combustion engine. And then this is the BRB 4500. It's a propane machine. The advantages to propane machines is you could virtually run that 24 hours a day. Once that propane tank empties, all you have to do is change the tank, start the machine back up, and you're back into business. With your battery operated machines, you have to stop and wait for them to fully recharge before you can use them again. Shot blasters. Shot blasters create a concrete surface profile of about three to nine. They're primarily used for remove or for prepping a surface for a coating, but can be used to remove some coatings from concrete. They will not work on anything that will absorb the impact of the shot. So if it's like a thick glue or a rubbery surface, shot blasters will be ineffective at removing it. These are our lineup of flooring solutions. On the left top, you have the, C, the uh, BP9. This is a very light duty 110 volt machine. Uh, maximum speed is about 200 square feet an hour and really isn't strong enough to remove much of anything, but is good to prep uh, concrete for a coating. Next to that, you have the BP9SP, a self-propelled unit that runs on 230 single phase. This unit can get you up to 450 square feet an hour. So it's good for your small to medium jobs. And then below those, you have the BP10 Super. This unit will run on 240 or 480 and give you up to about 1500 square feet an hour making it good for your medium to large jobs. Now, all three of these units do require a dust collector to go with them. They're just not pictured in this uh, presentation. Then on the right side, you have the BP-1027. 
This is a propane powered and is all enclosed. You've got the dust collector and the shot blaster all built into the same unit. So you do not need a, an additional dust collector to go out with this. This unit will also do about 1500 square feet an hour, making it good for your medium to large jobs. This here is a cutaway view of a shot blaster. They're all a little different on the inside, but they all work the same way. The green represents your shot, the yellow represents the debris coming off the floor. So your shot is gravity fed into a wheel that is spinning at a high rate of speed. It propels the shot to the floor, breaking off whatever's on the surface. The shot and the debris are carried back up. The shot will fall into the hopper. The debris would be carried off to a dust collector that would be hooked there to the top of the unit. The shot will continue to make its round to the floor and back into the hopper until it too gets worn down to an amount that it gets taken to the dust collector. And then on the right hand side, you see different shots. The larger the number on the shot, the course of the profile it's going to give you. But not all these shots can be used in the same piece of equipment. Using the uh, right on propane unit as an example, you can only use somewhere between 390 and 490. If you start using shots smaller than that, it'll hit the floor once and be carried back into the dust collector. If you start using shot larger than that, the inside's not built for it and it'll start to wear the parts and something's going to break. Here's an example of the BP9SP. This floor had some VCT tile on it. They scraped that up and there's a thin shadow of glue left on the floor. With 330 shot, you'll see here in a minute afterwards, there you have a concrete surface profile of about three. So you can clean that floor up, put your coating down. This is the ride-on, the BP-10. This unit, one of the advantages to shot blasters, how you see all these grooves and breakouts in the concrete. A shot blaster will get down and clean out all the holes, all the grooves, cleaning them down to bare concrete. Where you see this little bit of a rubber membrane, it does no damage to that. Scarfires, planers, flail drums. Scarfires can complete, can create a concrete surface profile of about four to seven. These units will remove concrete faster and more aggressively than shot blasters or grinders. These cutting wheels that you see here, they are loose fitted on that drum. The drum spins at a high rate of speed, making the teeth spin. As the drum comes around, it will break away anything that's on that surface, cutting it off the surface. But these units do leave a very rough surface and may not be the proper tool or else you need something in between them before you put down your flooring. Shavers. These are similar to the um, planers in that they quickly remove flooring, but this is a more surgical approach. Instead of using impact to break away the surface, they're using stacked diamond blades to cut away the surface. Here's examples of some uses for a shaver. You can see down there in the lower left-hand corner, they used it to cut blocks into the concrete. In the top right-hand corner with that long arm out in the front, they're using it to flatten the floor. That'll go through and cut down on the high spots, making it level with the lower spots. And then under that is an example of safety grooving. They can use that in areas of, um, where there's wet surfaces to help prevent slipping. Here's the shaver in action. So you can see that 
when they do the cut, it leaves like a little corduroy finish. So depending on what you're doing with this floor, if you were trying to polish it afterwards, you could take a grinder and easily knock that uh, corduroy back off of it. The unit does have two, it does have a dust collector. <clears throat> you have one hose coming to the bottom, cleaning up after the cut. Then this smaller hose is going to the front of the machine, cleaning up as it cuts so that you have no airborne silica dust. Scabblers. Scabblers create a concrete surface profile of about seven to nine. Basically, these are air-powered pistons underneath there with a, a bit like you see pictured here. And these bits are just traveling straight up and down like hammers, beating that top surface, breaking it off. Usually these will be used for coatings greater than a quarter of an inch. Grinders can create a concrete surface profile of about one to three. Uh, with special tooling, I can get you up to about five or six. These are used for removing coatings, prepping for coatings, smoothing concrete, and polishing concrete. They come in both electric and propane. Across the top, you have our electric units. This first one here is an edger. It is 208 single phase and is just for getting along the edges of the wall. The next one is a 110 unit. Again, being 110, it's very light duty, plain concrete, you can get about 200 square feet an hour. Next to that, you have the uh, 25. This unit can run on anything from 200 to 240, single or three phase. This unit gets you about 580 square feet an hour. On the bottom, you have our propane units. The first one is a 20 inch propane, gets about 500 square feet an hour. Then you have the 30 inch propane, which is about a thousand square feet an hour. And then you have the right on propane grinder, which can get you speeds up to about 6,000 square feet an hour. And with the grinders, you have an array of tools depending on what it is you're trying to accomplish. I wanna cover all these toolings in another slide in more detail. Here's an example of the unit in operation. The unit on the right has been being made since the 1960s. The one on the left, is the Lavina 30 inch propane unit. And you can see behind that machine, it's already clean. So it's ready to be vacuumed up and put down a coating. Or if he's trying to accomplish something else, just move on to the next step. Here's underneath both of those machines. You can see that both of them have the exact same diamonds. One of the things that makes this machine more effective is it is a planetary grinder. So you're gonna have three heads that are spinning, which are mounted to a larger plate that is counter spinning. So you have a lot more motion going on under that machine. And then air scrubbers. These units can be used as an air scrubber or negative air machine. And the only difference is how you use them. If you take this unit and just set it into the, the room with you, it's bringing the air through a preliminary filter, then taking it through a HEPA filter and blowing out 99.9% .9 clean air. So putting it in the room with you, exhausting it into the room, you're using it as an air scrubber. You're just using it to clean the air. If you're in a situation where you can have none of the dust or germs escaping from the area you're working in, you will create a negative environment. So what you'll do is you'll tent off the area that you're working. You will set this unit inside the tent with you. However, you will exhaust the clean air outside the tent. 
What this does is for the fan, in order for it to make up air, it will be drawing in air from any loose seams around that tent. This creates an inflow of air and your germs or your dust cannot swim upstream, so to speak, to get outside of that tent. Your diamond tooling comes in three basic categories. You're gonna have your metals. Your metals are gonna be your workhorses. Those are the ones that are prepping for coatings, uh, grinding off coatings, grinding down the floors. Your hybrids, and as they suggest, they have some metals in them and they have some resin in them. They are just a uh, finer cutting tool to uh, take out the scratches from the metals. You won't be able to remove coatings with them, um, and you won't be able to flatten the floor very easily with them. They're just primarily just an intermediate step between the hybrid or the metals and the resins. And then your resins are just your finer finishing tools to give you a finer finish on the floor. Your diamonds themselves come in different bonds. You have soft concrete diamonds, which are going to have a hard bond. Soft concrete is very abrasive. So you need a bond that holds on to those diamonds longer so that they don't just wear out. Then hard concrete is not very abrasive. So you need a softer bond that will wear away easier to keep exposing new diamonds so that they will continue to cut. If you take soft concrete diamonds and you run them on hard concrete, you'll get a, a little bit of cutting after out of them, but then they're going to glaze over and just quit cutting. They'll never wear out, but they won't be cutting the floor. The opposite, of course, is true if you were to take hard concrete diamonds and put them on soft concrete. You can put them on, maybe get a couple hundred square feet done, and they'd be totally burnt up. Normally, a set of diamonds can get you around six to 10,000 square feet. Here are the diamonds that we use in flooring solutions. These are the ones that go with our Lavina diamonds. And the top, you have single buttons, double buttons, single bars, and double bars. Just like the bowling pin analogy, the single button is going to be more aggressive than the double buttons because you're applying more weight to less surface area. Your bars are better at removing coatings than your buttons. However, you have to be careful if you're polishing because they can leave deep scratches in the concrete. Then using this chart, these diamonds as a chart, if you're working on a floor, you're using yellow diamonds and they're cutting extremely slow. As you move down this chart to the grays, the reds, the golds, with each step, you will be cutting faster and faster. However, your diamond life will be shorter. And of course the opposite's true. If you're working on a floor and it's cutting fast and the diamonds are burning up too quickly, as you go up this chart, they will start lasting longer and cutting slower. This is where your scratch test, the Mohs hardness test that we had talked about earlier comes into play. Your soft concrete is a two to three, your medium and so forth. If you match the concrete hardness to the diamonds, then you get the maximum performance in life out of the diamond. And then with the grinders, you have specialty tooling. Your bush hammers, your carbide scrapers, and your PCDs. Your carbide scrapers are for taking coatings, scratching coatings off the, the top of the computer, or off the concrete. So like your glues, um, some resins, things like that is what they'll take off. Your bush hammers will give you an effect very similar to a shop blaster. 
Right here, you can see a concrete surface profile of five and a concrete surface profile chip of six. And you can see this floor done with the bush hammers was somewhere in between. It's a little more coarse than the five, but maybe not quite as coarse as the six. And then PCDs. PCDs, that stands for polycrystalline diamond is used for removing thick coatings off of concrete. Ideally, you don't wanna to touch the concrete with them. What you'll do is you'll put this on a, co on a coating and you will take it down to just before you're at the concrete, at which point you can switch to diamonds and grind the rest of it off. You can see here in this picture where they were run on plain concrete that they leave very deep scratches in the concrete. Polished concrete. By definition, polished concrete is a floor that has been mechanically ground, honed, densified, and polished using a series of finer grit industrial diamonds until you have reached the maximum level of shine the floor is capable of or your desired level or budget. So we can take brand new concrete after it's set up for 28 days, or we can take existing concrete and turn it into a really nice serviceable floor. The polishing process, the first is going to be removal, removing any of the coatings or whatever's on the surface of that concrete. And again, you want to remember that to use the least aggressive method to take that off. Then we will start with our metals and we will grind the floor. We'll do the 30 grits and the 70 grits. Then the next step is honing. These are going to be your hybrids and the, the early stages of your resins, your 50 and 100 hybrids and 200 resins. And then polishing starts out at 400. 400 gives you a very dull luster, sort of a satin finish. 800 is your first step where you actually start to see reflectivity in the concrete. Then you can go up higher to your 16 and 3000. Visually, you won't notice a lot more shine with it, but what you'll see is clarity. So if you were looking at lights reflecting in a floor done with 800, and then look at them once you've done it with 1600, it's gonna be kind of like focusing a camera lens. The image itself is going to be a little bit sharper. And then the benefits of polished concrete. First, superior durability. Properly maintained, Polished concrete can last as long as the concrete does. This makes it cost effective because it is a long life, long life floor. It is a lower maintenance floor. So it's not a no maintenance floor, but it does require less maintenance than your VC VCT tiles and other flooring surfaces. It has improved reflectivity. A lot of architects now are designing this into the building so that they can put in less light fixtures and reduce the energy requirements for that building. Elimination of dusting. Dusting, that is a natural process of concrete as it starts to break down. Through the polishing process, you're gonna use a densifier. And densifier goes back in and rehardens that surface and helps to eliminate the dusting. And then reduce tire wear is just because it's a smoother surface. No production or plant shutdowns. So you can go in and do one section a night. Um, a good example is Walmart. They'll go in and probably do about a thousand to 2000 square feet a night. Remove everything from that area, polish it up, put everything back, then the next night, go in and do the next section. And for all these reasons, it's ideal for areas of heavy foot traffic. 
And it's also considered environmentally friendly. You're putting less materials on the project. You don't have carpets that will eventually make their ways back to a landfill. You're reducing airborne contaminants. Again, that's through the densification process. All the chemicals used during the process are low VOC, and these align with the lead rating system. So builders can get lead points for using polished concrete. And where can you polish concrete? You can actually polish anywhere there is concrete. However, it's not always the right floor for that purpose. Um, a good example would be your dog kennels. Um, a lot of times after they move an animal out of the um, holding facility, they use bleach to sanitize it. Bleach is a very harsh chemical. It'll actually etch concrete. So depending on the use of the floor, it may not always be the proper surface. But in most of your facilities, you can see here, industrial manufacturing, warehouses, retail shopping center, automotive dealers, you'll see polished concrete floors in a lot of the buildings now. Resources. All our flooring solution stores have the concrete surface prep guide pictured here. Inside it are basically the notes from this class. Inside you have areas, these are places where, the, uh, where they're polishing or repairing concrete. You have your questions to ask. Where are they starting from? Where are they going? Then on the back, you have all the different equipment with the production rates and the specs for that equipment. We also offer webinars. We have a virtual concrete similar to this, has a little more polishing information in it, but it is every Tuesday from two to three Eastern time. And then we also offer a grow your business. This one entertains the possibility of adding more lines to your offerings, and it covers in more detail the um, maintenance of polished concrete. Then twice a month, we're doing live training shows across the country. This here is the, the current schedule that we have. In this show, live, hands-on, you get to repair concrete, joint filling, staining, polishing, everything that you would need to know on a job. You can scan this little QR code and it'll take you directly to the uh, register site if you're interested in attending one of these classes. Additionally, for everyone that's on this class today, we are offering you $100 off your next rental of any of this equipment that we have discussed today. So at this point, we will open it up to questions. Ron, fantastic uh, job. And yes, we have a Yeti Tumblr challenge, if you will, for anybody that can stump the band. Uh, but terrific job. I've uh, had the pleasure of watching this on more than one occasion, and it just keeps getting better and better. I hope everybody agrees. We do have several requests for a copy of this uh, of, a, of the PDF version of this presentation, and the answer is absolutely yes. We would be happy to provide that to you. Uh, we we uh, just wanted to make sure that we tacked on any other Q&A that comes from this before we finalize it and put it in the resource library for ISSA, as well as uh, when Ron clicks the next slide, uh, you're going to see flooring.info at sunbeltrentals.com. There's several ways to contact us. Uh, the the flooring.info would be one we'd love you to put in your favorites if ever you did need support from any of our uh, soon to be 60 locations throughout the U.S. and climbing. There's also an 844 number, or you have Ron and myself directly to contact. Uh, and uh, in this case, just uh, uh, tap a note to Ron Bridges. It's ron.bridges, Ronald, excuse me, ronald.bridges at sunbeltrentals.com. Uh, and we will be glad to get you the current version of this presentation. 
Uh, in your resources for this webinar, you do have the Surface Prep Guide that Ron mentioned, which was also a question. And you also have an invitation to our workshops that uh, once you get that invitation to our workshops, you can sign on there free of charge. Uh, and we provide lunch. It's a great place to network. If you come to these uh, throughout the US, uh, you might see some friends or meet some customers or be able to uh, network in a, in a very proactive way. So let's get into the Yeti Stump the uh, Band contest right there. Um, we have some great questions. So here's one that Ron may 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 have you on your on your heel here. Do you have does Sunbelt have a pouring spec resource that can provide to contractors for newly poured floors? Do we have a pouring spec resource that can be provided to contractors for newly poured floors? And Ron, I'll let you uh, start with that one. I can, um, that is available on the American Society of Concrete Contractors. They have written the specs um, that you can go into the meetings and discuss with them. Um, so it's easy obtainable. Um, I don't think we have it at our stores, but it is on the American Society of Concrete Contractors website. And actually we can provide that as another resource to the final version of the PDF that we're going to supply to you. So great question and uh, nice, nice catch there, Ron. So uh, how about water blasters for surface prep of coating removal? First of all, the question is, do we rent water blasters? And, and that's run pretty sure that's pretty quick. No, but do you want to address water blasters for coating removal and your experience around those? Um. I have used those in the past, and basically they're just very powerful uh, water um, pressure washers. Um, however, somewhat dangerous, um, easily to, to injure yourself with those. I'm not aware of anybody that would actually rent one. There are companies that own their own and will do the work for you. But I don't think it's gonna be an item that we're gonna carry because of the liability. All right, very good. Ron, do you have any suggestions for blending edges with the main part of the floor that grinding and polishing, especially where an edger machine is a different weight than the main grinding and polishing machine? So yeah, that's a great question. You, you, obviously, you're paying close attention to our grinder slide that showed the difference between the edgers, the uh, uh, electrical, and the propane, and even the new ride-on 60-inch. Uh, so, Ron, how would you blend those edges in from a lighter machine uh, to make it uh, look like the, the, the heart of the floor? Polishing a floor um, is kind of like paint and walls. You always want to do your edge work first. Now, what you're going to do is your first grind will be around the edges. Then your next grind will be with the bigger machine going over top of that so that you're covering a larger footprint with the bigger machine. And this will help that blend in to the rest of the floor. You also wanna make sure that whatever diamonds you're using work well together. Um, some diamonds leave a really different mark than others. The diamonds we use have all been certified to work together. So you won't have as much shadowing when you go around doing your edging and then going over with your big machine. But again, you've got to stay one step ahead with the edger or you will create a border around that room. Very good. So we have a lot of great questions coming and I'm going to get right to them. I just wanted to also suggest that if if any of this is getting you nervous or concerned, or if you believe it's uh, something that's outside of your wheelhouse, that's okay. That's actually part and parcel of why we have these presentations. But as Ron opened up the presentation with, these are acquirable skills. It is largely a science, so we, we, can, we can get you there from here. And, uh, and, and if you do have upcoming projects where you want some eyes on the project, Consultation is, is free of charge, you know, as long as you're within, you know, 60 to 100 mile range of one of our 
current stores and Sunbelt can also help you in our general tool stores. So we'd love the opportunity to try to walk you through some of these uh, opportunities that may be coming your way. Um, do you change the concrete polishing process if you do not use a densifier, Ron? You're not going to get as long lasting of a floor surface if you don't use a densifier. Um, right now, when you walk on a concrete floor, that top surface is the hardest, where they've troweled it. By grinding, you're taking the hardest part of that concrete off in order to polish it. And Densifier's purpose is to re-harden that surface. So again, it's just making a more durable floor if you uh, use the Densifier. All right, very good. So what was the concrete hardness test called? I can take that one. That's the Mohs hardness test, which uh, helps you measure concrete surface, the concrete surface profile. And uh, so that's, that's one that will be in the presentation as will the illustrations of the concrete surface profile. Uh, a lot of questions on the $100 code. Again, that $100 coupon will be in the resources for this webinar, so you should be able to download it with a couple of clicks. Uh, if you, again, you can also email Ron or myself, and we'll be happy to send you the, uh, the coupon itself. And the coupon code is SBPRD100, and that can go on the actual, uh, you know, the contract to get you that $100 um, uh, discount. Uh, is there a point where an older concrete floor, based on age or condition, should not be polished? Great question, I'm gonna start from the top. Is there a point where an older concrete floor, based on age or condition, should not be polished, or can a concrete floor in any condition be prepped for polishing? All right, Ron, that's, that's right up your alley. <laughs> yeah, I, well, first of all, any floor, can be polished. Um, however, not all floors are going to look that well polished. Or you could um, end up doing a lot of grinding to get that floor up to a, a, a likable level. So um, the age of the concrete really doesn't affect anything. It doesn't matter how old the concrete is, you can polish it. The, um, the, the shape of the concrete, I've seen some pretty rough floors that um, I have polished and made them look nice. You have a lot of very heavy aggregate exposure in order to get them down. And a lot of times you have to use other products to help fill in the little pits around the stones and the like to get a good shine. But you can polish anything, um, just some takes a lot more work. All right, very good. So I am gonna give away a Yeti, uh, a Yeti tumbler to, to the first person, Jeff with uh, ISSA. I'm gonna ask you to, to grab the name of the first person as the winner that can tell me what HEPA means. We've mentioned HEPA filtration quite a few times on this presentation today. So if you know or can get very close to what the H-E-P-A acronym of HEPA is, uh, just put it in the, uh, the Q&A and Jeff will catch you and we'll give the first one that can answer that question a nice Yeti tumbler. All right, how about removing wax from a concrete floor that has been there for over 20 years? Great question. How about removing that wax, Ron? Well, my first question to you is going to be, what are you doing after you remove the wax? Now, again, where are you at and where are you going? The reason I ask that, if you're just trying to get the wax off and you want to try and maintain the, um, the surface, then you're going to have to use some sort of a chemical method similar to what you would use for uh, VCT tiles. However, if you're going to be putting down, let's say an epoxy coating, or you're wanting to polish the concrete, then I would just start out with my diamonds, my 30 grits, and grind it all off and then polish the floor on up. 
Very good. And we actually ha have some nice pictures and, and we can provide you with some resources of that. Uh, just, uh, just shoot Ron an email and, and we'll, we'll help you guide your way through that. Here's one that kind of is reflective of the video that, by the way, that was Ron Bridges running the Levina 30 uh, propane. And, uh, and that's a great video we would be glad to provide you with as well. After removal of VCP flooring, how best to remove the trace border left behind that show essentially the previous border of the 12 by 12 tile? Great question. And uh, Ron, go after that one. That is not always possible. Um, a lot of times when you polish a floor that's had VCT tile on it, you will forever see shadowing from where those tiles were. Um, again, concrete's a sponge and those lines could go all the way down to the dirt. And um, no matter how far you grind, those lines could still be present. Um, the only way to hide them would be to put a solid coating back over the floor. Um, Cause even stain, stainings like staining a piece of wood, any of your grains or um, uh, any of your grains or lines or any visible marking is going to show differently than the rest of the floor. So you might be able to blend it in a little bit, but they'll always be there. Excellent, all right. Uh, so, Jeff, I hope we have a winner of the Yeti cooler for the uh, HEPA acronym HEPA. Uh, let me know and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll announce that. Here's another one for a Yeti tumbler. Ron mentioned during the safety message early in the presentation a particular kind of dust that can be fatal and, and very dangerous, and we want to protect against that with the proper PPE gear. The first answer in the Q&A box that, define, that identifies the dust that is very dangerous in uh, the alteration of concrete will win a Yeti tumbler. Here's a great question, and it's actually a two-part question. The easy part is, is it necessary to use a densifier if, for a floor that you're applying a, epoxy coating uh, versus taking it up through a polishing process? So is it necessary to use a densifier on a floor if they're going to put epoxy coating on it, Ron? Well, the only advantage to that, if you had some extremely soft concrete, um, you can go in and densify it a couple times to the point of rejection, and it'll re-harden that concrete. However, I would recommend that you would get with the manufacturer of the coating you're putting down to make sure that it's all compatible. Because you don't want to put something down on that floor that will make the coating come back off of it. All right, great question, great answer. How much harder does a densifier make the surface? How much harder does a densifier make the surface? Okay, I cannot give an actual answer to that. Um, that would have to be done through an actual testing procedure because every piece of concrete is going to have its own personality. Um, it will get harder through densification. Um, we've got uh, training facilities that we polish over and over and continually putting more and more densifier, and it gets to the point where you can hardly grind these floors anymore because the concrete so hard. So I'm going to say that uh, we just stumped the band. Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to say I'm stumped on that one because without an actual that, core, without an actual core and an actual lab test, there's no way to to say. Yeah, valiant effort, but uh, Jeff, let's get that uh, that question on how much harder does a dip fire make concrete, and that. Uh, person has now won a nice one of these really nice uh, Sunbelt uh, Yeti tumblers. And we also have a winner on the HEPA question, which was by Robert Gonzalez. Robert, nice job. High efficiency particulate air filter is what a HEPA filter is. So excellent, Robert. Great, great job. Uh, so uh, let's go to, we got, we got a lot of people that tried and, and, a lot, and we have some several other good answers, a couple of them close. But Robert takes that Yeti tumbler away. A lot of participation on HEPA. That, uh, that's a good one. Let's see here. All right. What is the best way for a contractor 
to protect a newly poured concrete floor during constructions from things like gouges from lifts, et cetera. We've seen the pallets be run across that floor with a nail sticking out of them, ram board and others. So what is the best way for a contractor to protect a newly poured concrete floor, Ron? Um, again, ram board was mentioned. That's normally your first thing. Um, also, when you're running your equipment on there, um, make sure that the company supplying your equipment doesn't, you know, tell them up front, check them for nails and the like in their tires. Um, they can put wheel covers over them, which will also help protect some, but if they're hiding a nail, that doesn't. Um, now, uh, even the RAM board will not hold up to nails in a pallet. Um, you could put plywood down. Um, that would probably add a lot of cost. I guess the, the main thing is just going to have to set standards at your construction meetings for these people that are on the floor to help protect them. All right. So the name of the dangerous dust that uh, uh, could be fatal is silica. And we have a winner on that. The first person that uh, entered that was Eric. And uh, uh, Jeff, if you would help me with this last name, I don't want to click on it right now. It might take me off task, but it does look like we have a nice winner. And there were several proper answers here with silica dust. And that is one that you want to stay uh, very up to date on OSHA's regulations on because uh, it could not only be uh, very dangerous for you and your crews, but uh, you can get some hefty fines out of that as well. So lots of answers on silica dust. Very good. Let's see what else we have. Um, and I know that we're going to lean on ISSA for our time constraints. We will continue to take any questions at ronald.bridges at sunbeltrentals.com. Uh, if any of you want the national support on any kind of opportunities, let me know. I'll be happy to help you with those. And then 24-7, you can send in any requests for help, support, quotations, if you do want to rent, uh, to flooring.info at sunbeltrentals.com, 24-7, 365 days a year. And Ed, K Eric Cagle, there you are, Mr. Cagle. Thank you very much for, for, uh, for, for jumping in there. Okay. Um, I think there was one question that came in earlier, and I'm going to go back to the original Q&A to get that, and then we'll land this right on time. There's a lot of people want this PDF. You will get the PDF. That, that's an easy one. You'll get the information on uh, concrete uh, uh, surface profiling as well as the concrete surface prep guide, the $100 coupon. And here was one that I think was... Um, all right, here you go, Ron. This will be the last one that will go out loud so we can uh, be good stewards to ISSA's presentation here. What can you use to remove moisture or urine stain from a polished concrete floor? Kind of goes back to your pet floor uh, example, but what can you use to remove mo moisture or urine stain from a polished concrete floor? Moisture itself, um, you can use carpet dryers or something just to dry the concrete out. Now, it depends on where that moisture is coming from. Um, if it's coming up through the, uh, the ground, if there's not a proper ground cover under there, um, you know, it's going to be a continual fight and you will um, start to see um, effervescence coming up into the concrete from chemicals and stuff evaporating in it. So I guess we need to determine where the water is coming from to try and fix that so that it'll stay dry. But time or uh, fans will dry that. Um, urine can be um, acidic and can actually etch the concrete. So it's one of those things that you would want to try. If you're polishing a floor, and you know that's going to be, let's say you're polishing a bathroom, there are coatings that you can put down for polished concrete to help protect against things like that. But if you've got a polished floor that wasn't protected, um, you may have to go back in and do a touch-up of that small area to bring it back up to the shine of the rest of the floor if it has actually etched the concrete. 
Very good. All right. That's great advice. Now, Ron, do you want to tap one more time around moisture barrier products? Uh, I, I do know there, there were a couple of questions in there around moisture barrier. You know, a lot of that you would do before you even lay the concrete. But do you want to talk about any other moisture barrier products before or after you, Brian? No, I don't, Rory. Okay. No. <laughs> well, I, I, I guess I just want no. myself. <laughs> no, the um, again, the biggest thing with the moisture barrier should have been done before the concrete was poured. Right. Um, if it has not, there is nothing that um, you can put down for polished concrete that will work as a moisture barrier. There are products out there if you're putting down coatings. Um, but now for something like that, I would refer you to Sherwin Williams or whoever's manufacturing your coating to tell you what kind of a, a barrier you can put down prior to putting their product down. Yeah, because you got a chemistry issue there and you want to make sure that you're aligning your apples and your apples and your oranges and your oranges. So very good. Well, uh, Jeff, we certainly want to thank you on behalf of Sunbelt Rentals for this time. We did go over a few minutes. I hope you don't mind, but the questions were just too good to to, uh, to leave out there. And uh, hopefully by now you've had a chance to take down some of this information here. We'd be happy to keep the conversation going. Uh, and if you need uh, private consultation, we're available for that too as part of our uh, part of our value equation. So thank you very much, ISSA, and thank you very much for all of the attendees that joined us today. Uh, we sure appreciate your time and attention.